Well, there you saw and heard the dancing feet of uh, Niall O'Leary, and he's a native of Dublin, but for the last 15 years or so, he's been in New York City. Used to ply his trade as an architect, but then he got so popular as a dancer and as a dance teacher, not much architecture anymore. Though, and we're very glad of that. Uh, in case you're wondering who's who up here on the stage, on the far, on my far left and your far right, one of the great Ilan Pipers in the history of Irish music on either side of the Atlantic, from Yonkers, Mr. Jerry O'Sullivan. <laughs> She's a rising young star in Irish music, and she's only 15 years of age. She's been playing with us since she was about 11, and she's getting a bit older now. But she's, she's, she's getting better with every passing day, as even if that's possible even. And uh, I'd like to make welcome from New Jersey, Haley Richardson. <laughs> and and uh, beside, beside uh, Haley on her right, uh, he originally is from Brooklyn, and he's the All-Ireland uh, Button Accordion Champion, and most recently, the winner of the National Heritage Award Fellowship, the highest artist, the highest award that a folk artist can get in America. Currently living in Baltimore on the accordion, Mr. Billy McComiskey. <laughs> I first met her when she was down from Boston at New York University. That was about 13 years or so ago. She plays all kinds of music. She plays classical music. She plays rock music. She plays punk music. Fortunately for us all, she sings and plays Irish music as well. Liz Handley here. He, he arrived in America around the same time as myself, and uh, he comes from, uh, from a, a small little tower, a town in County Tipperary called uh, Carrick on Shore, a, a modest little town with much to be modest about. Uh, and and uh, he's been over in, 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 the, in the Northeast, up in Boston for the longest time, and currently living in Rhode Island, one of the great singer-songwriters in the history of Irish music, Mr. Robbie O'Connell. <laughs> and as Joseph Lennon told you, I'm Mick Maloney from Limerick, uh, the cultural capital of the Celtic world, as you all know. <laughs> And I lived in Philadelphia here for the longest time. I lived in the hood in Germantown for nearly 28 years and uh, I was delighted. I still bleed Eagles Green and I'm delighted at their <laughs> success at the moment. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't find, I've been in New York now for nearly 20 years, you wouldn't find me supporting any New York team. Uh, anyway, uh, it's great to be back here in Villanova. Taught here on and off for about 15 years, uh, mostly with Jim Murphy, uh, who can't be with us here tonight. He's over in Galway. And I enjoyed every year of it. And, uh, I'm up in New York. New York University made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I've been up there now for a while. But uh, one of the first songs I learned uh, when, I, when I arrived in, in Philadelphia back in 1973, and I didn't learn it from anybody in particular, I learned it from, from an old 78 record that I got from a man called Norbert McGettigan, uh, who was running his father's travel agent business that he inherited from him, the whole McGettigan family. And it was from John McGettigan, he was a great recording artist back in the day in the 1920s over in, in, in the Victor Studios in Camden. And he recorded a lot of tunes and songs, and this is one of them. And I felt, because I just arrived in Philadelphia, that I should learn it. Oh, I am a rambling Irish man. I've traveled this country o'er in search of an occupation as I've never done before. I made a resolution, and I think it's a very good plan for to travel to America and view that foreign land. When I landed in Philadelphia, the girls all jumped for joy. Says one up to the other, now there goes an Irish boy. They invited me to go with them, and they took me by the hand. And the toast went merrily round the town, good luck to the Irish man. I've been in Philadelphia not more than a week or so When I made a resolution, some other place to go With me knapsack on me shoulder, me shillelagh in me hand I set out through Pennsylvania like a rambling Irish man And I travelled through Bucks County, out there among the Dutch But as for conversation, well, there wasn't very much but I, with signs and signals, gave the girls to understand the courage and the nature of this rambled and Irish man.
And I went into a tavern, and there I spent the night. And the landlady's fair daughter, in me she took the light. And she hugged me, and she kissed me, and she took me by the hand. And she whispered in her mother's ear, I'm in love with this Irish man. Oh, daughter, dearest daughter, what is this you are going to do? To fall in love with an Irish man, the lad you never knew. With his knapsack on his shoulder, his shillelagh in his hand. Ah, mother dear, I'd roam the world with this rambling Irish man. Me and me darling wife I'd work for her and I toil for her And I do the best I can And I'd never make her rue the day She married an Irish man good at singing on choruses? Anybody else? <laughs> well, this has got a real easy chorus. It goes, Radley fall the day, me boys, Radley fall the day. Think you could manage that? It's some kind of old Gaelic. I think it means these guys are great. Where can we get their CDs? <laughs> this is a, a new version of an old song called A Jug of Punch, and I'm sure you'll pick it up as we go along here. Pleasant evening in the month of June As I sat down with my glass and spoon A small bird sat on an ivy bunch And the song he sang was a jug of punch Radley fall the day, boys, Radley fall the day What more diversion can the man desire? And to sit him down by an alehouse fire Upon his knee, oh, a comely wench And on the table, a jug of punch Radley fall the day, me boys, Radley fall the day now Some drink ale and some drink wine those lords and ladies like their claret fine But I trade all the grapes in the bunch For just one sip from a jug of punch Radley fall the day, boys, Radley fall the day Those learned doctors with all their art Can cure the pain that lies on the heart but a wolf of thirst you can quickly quench You're snug outside of a jug of punch Radley fall the day, me boys, Radley fall the day I'm dead and lie in my grave No marble tombstone will I pray 
Just lower me down with the rope and winch And on my heart lay a jug of punch Radley fall the deep boys, Radley fall the day But I'm not ready for that churchyard cold Stir up the fire and then bar the door and all the cares we will surely drench With our glasses full from a jug of punch Radley fall the deemy boys, Radley fall the day Radley fall the deemy boys, Radley fall the day Well, I'll start things off next, folks, with the air on the pipes. And this is a lovely uh, <coughs> ballad. I'm not going to sing it, but it's the, uh, it's the instrumental version of a lovely ballad from Fermanagh uh, called The Greenfields of Canada, Gre Greenfields of America. And it comes from the singing of Patty Tunney and his mother, Mrs. Bridget Tunney. And it's a, it's a classic, iconic Ulster melody. So play that, follow it up with a couple of reels together.
Jerry O'Sullivan there, and the reel he went into after the Slayer was actually a composition of Billy's here. Has made it into the tradition, everybody plays it. Um, gonna have Niall dancing a hornpipe now, and uh, I, I suppose there's no more visible aspect of Irish uh, performance uh, around the world than dance these days, after River Dance in 1994, the whole dance tradition. And we were mildly ashamed of it up to that time because it was, it was very kind of old fashioned, we thought, and, and uh, you know, it was very Victorian with the hands by the sides and all that. We didn't want much to do with it. But then after River Dance, of course, everybody thought it was great. Uh, and uh, went over the wall is found just about all over the world now, different people taking Irish dance. It's, it's the League of Nations. Um, and, uh, but dancing has been around a long time. And uh, uh, it was originally taught by, in Ireland by the dancing masters, very, very colorful characters. They, they rambled around Ireland in the Victorian era especially and they taught not only dancing, but elocution and deportment uh, and good manners and good behavior. You can tell we're all graduates of Irish dancing academies up here on stage. But uh, the hornpipe was, was carried to America and was, it was very big on the American stage. Uh, Irish dancers then were all called jig dancers, even if they were dancing hornpipes or reels. And all the great dancers, including Niall, have their own versions of hornpipes. And uh, these days, uh, they slow it down because uh, you know, there's so many beats in it. Uh, and, but uh, now we'll do it the, the modern way, which is fairly slow down. Then we'll speed up and he will revert to the 19th century version. <laughs> One of the, the, the first visits uh, I made south uh, uh, of the Mason-Dixon line was uh, back uh, in 1979. I hadn't been in Appalachia before. And I was amazed to find uh, down there, uh, I suppose you'd, you'd call them our cultural cousins. A lot of people descended from the, the migrations from the north of Ireland. Uh, some people call them the Scotch-Irish, and they call themselves indeed the Scotch-Irish, or people of uh, northern Presbyterian descendants. And, uh, and down there in Appalachia, they, most of them came over in the, in the 18th century. They met other people that they wouldn't have met back in the homeland. They met African Americans, they met English uh, people. And out of that whole mixture came old time music and uh, clogging, or it's often called flatfoot. And uh, we liken a lot of our concerts uh, when, we, when we're able to, 
uh, to show um, our, our cousins, our, I, I call them our cultural cousins, from down in Appalachia, doing a dance that has some imprint from what you just saw, but really has gone in, in quite a different direction because of the time factor and, and just because people always uh, change when they're away from the original source. We're very delighted to have here, uh, and this is a, a most unexpected treat for me and for all of you, I hope, too. Two wonderful dancers in that tradition. Uh, there's Matt, uh, Matthew Alwell and Emily Olson. And uh, I met Matt when he was dancing with the famous uh, group, talking group Footworks, and they danced all over the joint. They were all over Europe. They were uh, in, in, uh, in, in different parts of the world, but mostly in America. They, did, they played all over the country for over, well over 25 years. Uh, and before that, there were the Green Glass Foggers, and uh, the Eileen Carson, who led Footworks, came out of that group. So we're very familiar with the clogging traditions. I'd like to invite out here Matt Alwell and Emily Olson, and uh, they're going to do some clogging for you. I'm going to sing a song now called Sanctuary, and the words come from um, a poem written by Vincent Woods, um, is a great, an, an excellent poet from County Leitrim in Ireland, based in Dublin at the moment, um, and he grew up near these, um, near the coal mines of Erigna, um, and the song is about that time when, when the coal um, mines were being shut down. And it's, it's called Sanctuary because it's about finding, um, finding sanctuary and finding solace in times of trouble and, and finding comfort in community and the land. And um, the, the melody of this song was written by uh, Martin O'Connor, a great Galway accordion player. Sanctuary. Here this is home Blue green mountains Ancestors bones Hear the heart can
pits of misery Boys old at 16 Then worn out from hutch and drill They toil the black seams Their ghosts on the mountain still By the ridge of the roan tree in the fields where I once ran wild, I close my eyes and the pitmen are there to see. Striding out again, You may wonder, or perhaps are too polite to ask, what the hell is the banjo doing in Irish music? And it's a very interesting story. Uh, the banjo originally is an African instrument, of course, and it was carried to America, not literally, but as an idea by African slaves. And they're recreated uh, in the plantations uh, and in the Caribbean, an instrument that uh, they called the banzier, the banze, the banza, the ban, always the ban something or other. Uh, and uh, it was played percussively. Um, back in Africa, it was, uh, it was a gourd strung with animal gut or horse hair on a long neck and uh, played to accompany singing or dancing. And instruments like that are, are found today uh, in places like Senegal and, uh, and, and, uh, and in the Ivory Coast uh, and in, in Nigeria as well. Um, in fact, if you, if, you, if you want to know about the history of the banjo, go to Monticello. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson, uh, a slave owner, of course, um, who took a great interest in, in the music of the slaves there and documented with great accuracy this instrument that eventually became known as the banjo when the technology changed. And it was appropriated by white people, a lot of them Irish-American, and used as a central instrument in minstrelsy, blackface minstrelsy, a very troubled and troubling chapter in American musical history. But some great songs are written there. Stephen Foster was, the, was the, another Irish-American, was the was uh, one of the great songwriters of minstrelsy, and so was Dan Emmett. And Dan Emmett was in the Virginia Minstrels, uh, and uh, they took the banjo to Ireland in, in 1844, the year before the Irish famine. And uh, it's been around in Ireland in one form or another ever since. And now there are at least 8,000 banjo players in Ireland. The, <laughs> the damage has been done, you might say, uh, and, uh, and it's not going to change. But um, Dan Emmett was a very famous songwriter, and he wrote the song I'm going to sing in honor of that of, of, of uh, his, his genius as a musician. He was a great banjo player, a great uh, fiddle player. Uh, he's best known as, as uh, the writer of the song Dixie. You all know Dixie. And he wrote it in 1859 on a wet day in New York City and watched with astonishment as it became the anthem of the South. I tell you, when we play south of Mississippi, uh, down south of the Mason-Dixon line, in places like Mississippi, and tell them that the anthem of the south was written by an Irish-American Yankee in New York City, that goes over like a lead balloon, I can tell you that much. <laughs> 
So anyway, this is the song he brought to Ireland. He played it in, in, in Cork, and I found that out. This is the Harvard Theatre Collection. He played it in Cork and in Dublin and in Belfast in the year 1844, called The Boatman's Dance. Hi, road, the boatman row, floating down the river of the Ohio. Hi, road, the boatman row, floating down the river of the Ohio. And the boatman dance, the boatman sing, the boatman up to everything. And when the boatman gets on shore, he spends his cash and he works for more. Dance the boatman dance, dance the boatman dance. Oh, dance all night till the broad daylight to go home with the girls in the morn. Hi, row the boatman, row floating down the river of the Ohio. Hi, row the boatman, row floating down the river of the Ohio. The oyster boat should stick to the shore, the fish and smack should venture more. The schooner sails before the wine, the steamboat leaves his feet behind. That's the boatman, that's, that's the boatman. Dance all night in the broad daylight to go home with the girls of the morning. I row the boatman row, float down the river of the Ohio. I row the boatman row, float down the river of the Ohio. I went to shore the other day to see what the boatman had to say. There I let my passion loose to put me in the calaboo. So dance the boatman, dance, dance the boatman, dance. Dance all night till the broad daylight to go home with the girls in the morn. I row the boatman row, floating down the river of the Ohio. I row the boatman row, floating down the river of the Ohio. Wife or don't dance at all. Sky blue jacket, tarpaulin hat, look out, me boys, for the night tail cat. Dance the boatman, dance, dance the boatman, dance. Oh, dance all night till the broad daylight to go home with the girls in the morning. I row the boatman, row, float down the river of the Ohio. I row the boatman, row, float down the river of the Ohio. The boatman is a thrifty man. There's nothing can do as the boatman can. Never did I see a pretty girl in my life, but that she was the boatman's wife. Oh, dance the boatman, dance, dance the boatman, dance. Oh, dance all night till the broad daylight to go home with the girls in the morning. I row the boatman, row, float down the river of the Ohio. I row the boatman, row, float down the river of the Ohio. I from the harp tradition and uh, this is from uh, the uh, 17th century uh, composed uh, as most of the harp music we, we play today uh, was by Turlick O'Carlin and he spanned a very turbulent time in Irish history uh, from the breakup of the old Gaelic order which saw the chieftains who were the patrons of the harpers take flight and go off to continental Europe taking with them their harpers indeed and the harp went on another journey then uh, from Spain across the Atlantic uh, to the New World to, and it's one of the reasons that it's one of the national instruments of Paraguay, Venezuela, and Mexico. But back in Ireland, there were some there were some harpers left, and uh, they um, they played in the big houses of the establishment, the Anglo-Irish establishment. <laughs> I 
think the harp was probably as hard to tune as the mandolin was in the big houses. And we're going to play a tune written by Charlie O'Carlin, very much in the style that he made uh, popular in Irish harping, a, a style that owed much to the old Irish harpers, but also a lot to the new music that was sweeping Europe, the Baroque, Baroque music of Renaissance Italy and the compositions of Vivaldi and Gimignani and Corelli. So there's kind of that, a bit of that in this tune we're going to play called Planksteen, uh, Planksteen Miss Maxwell. <laughs> Frank Hart was a, a wonderful um, singer, traditional singer from Dublin, and, and a wonderful song collector, and a great friend of ours over the years. Uh, we got many, many songs from Frank. He was, he was the guy you would go to if you were looking for words of a song, or you were missing a verse or something, because uh, he had a, a, a huge knowledge of the songs. He collected about 10,000 songs in his lifetime. And I always thought of Frank as the, the keeper of the songs 
but he had a passion for songs that was most unusual. He saw them a little differently probably than you or I would. He saw them as, as being important for one thing and uh, little eyewitness accounts of things that had happened. And uh, he coined a wonderful expression. He said, those in power write the history, those who suffer write the songs. And uh, after he died some years ago, um, I wanted to write a song as a tribute to Frank, and I wanted to use those wonderful lines of his in it. So this is uh, just a simple story, really, of how he got into the music himself. Um, but it's called The Keeper of the Song. That once rash voice is silent now, no more we'll hear it soar. Call us back to Dublin streets and Napoleon's cruel war. To feel again the nation's pride as our heroes made a stand. Are the sorrows of our countrymen when great hunger gripped the land? Though his voice rings out no more, his words still linger on. Those in power write the history, those who suffer write the song. It was on the streets of Boyle one day, he heard a tinker's song. Of those heroes bold in not the who bitterly were wrong. His life would never be the same from that fateful moment on. For he realized he found the truth in the verses of a song. Though his voice rings out no more, his words still those in power write the history, those who suffer write the song. For the voices of his people and the stories that they told, cherished like a wealthy man, my treasure bars of gold. Their songs like ghosts that long endured through centuries now gone were proudly given life once more by the keeper of the song. Though his voice rings out no more, his words still linger on. Those in power write the history, those who suffer write the song. Though his voice rings out no more, his words still linger on. Those in power write the history, those who suffer write the song. to finish the first half of the selection of reels here that'll take about a 20 minute break and that'll be 20 minutes American corporate time we're talking now not Irish time and uh, we'll see we do have some CDs for sale and a, a, a book and a, a DVD and we'll see you in a little bit
Myself and Haley are going to start with a couple of tunes that Haley's going to play, and uh, that certainly got the lights. Uh, <laughs> Haley, how did you how did you end up playing Irish music? You don't you didn't have it in your family. You didn't have it in your neighbourhood. And how did you how did you end up playing Irish music so well? Well, when I was growing up with uh, my two older brothers, we were all homeschooled, and as part of our learning, my mom asked us each to pick an instrument and she would get us lessons and uh, teach us how to play. And so um, I picked the fiddle. And so we star I started with just traditional classical music lessons. And when I was about five, uh, my mom saw a poster in our local library for a Kevin Burke concert. And she had no idea what Irish music was. And um, she thought, hey, let's go see another genre of music played on the instrument that Haley's learning, it might be interesting. So little did she know it would take over our lives years later. Um, yeah. And um, how did you find the Irish, there's no Irish music community in your in your village mm -hmm. or your town. Where? Which town are you from? I'm from Pittsgrove, South Jersey. Yeah, but there's no big Irish scene there. No. no. Mm -hmm. So how did you meet actu actually meet Irish musicians then? I would meet a lot of them in Philly, uh, a couple of sessions that I still go to. Uh, today, but I found that they were all very welcoming of especially a young person in Irish music. Um, it was very nice to meet a Irish community in Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I should tell you that haley has been going back to Ireland and causing total consternation. She's been winning the All-Ireland title in the fiddle, coming from New Jersey, and beating all the Irish kids in Ireland. And they're, they're sort of used to it now, but they must have been shocked when, when you came over first out of, <laughs> out of the blue, this kid from New Jersey. But anyway, you're going to play a couple of tunes with us for, for us, aren't you? Yes, yeah. uh, I'll play a couple of reels. The first one uh, is called Lord MacDonald's, and I got it from a recording of the great Michael Coleman. Um, and then the second one is called The Bunch of Keys.
Richardson. Last year was the uh, centenary of the 1916 Easter Rebellion in Ireland. And uh, Nick asked me would I write a song. I'm sure a lot of people wrote songs last year. Uh, I was trying to come up with a slightly different take on it. And one of the things that's always fascinated me about history is that it's a, it's a very distorted rearview mirror because looking back on things, we never see them the way that they were seen when they were happening. And uh, the 1916 rebellion is a perfect example of that because when it first started, there was hardly any uh, public support at all for the, for the leaders of the rebellion. People thought they were just crazy. And, uh, it was really only when it was all over and the British began to execute the leaders that uh, public opinion shifted. So I thought it might be interesting to write a song from the point of view of uh, a man whose friend and neighbor, who was one of, one of the volunteers that got killed that week, and kind of trying to see it through his eyes. So this is called Fools and Dreamers. He was always a dreamer, that was well known With the stories and songs about Emmett and Tone But no one imagined that we'd see his name When they published the list of the wounded and slain And he had a few jars on a Saturday night he was full of all talk about freedom and rights. He'd sing the old songs about brave Irish men and the make in our country a nation again. Fools and dreamers, dreamers and fools, madmen and schemers posing all the rules. Can't help but wonder what history will show. Villains are heroes, nobody knows. At the job Tuesday morning, there was no sign of him. And somebody told me that he hadn't locked in. It was late Friday evening when word came around Near a load of burnt rubble his body was found There were rumours he drank with some of my Orby men and Spent weekends drilling way down in the glen and All of us thought it was just idle chance that a man with four children was more sense than that. Fools and dreamers, dreamers and fools, madmen and schemers opposing all rules. And I can't help but wonder what history will show. Villains are heroes, nobody knows. on Monday as far as I know had to tell you the truth now I'm dreading to go to see all the children just trying to be brave 
And his wife racked with grief as she weeps o'er the grave. She'll have to find work, it's just scrubbing floors, where the children the nuns will be opening their doors. We'll take up a collection from his friends in our street. It may go some small way towards making ends meet. Dreamers, dreamers and fools, mad men and skeevers opposing all rules. I can't help but wonder what history will show. Villains are heroes, nobody knows. He was always That's a kind way to put it, now that he's dead. But some of his friends who had known him since school said he should have known better, the bloody old fool. I saw him last Sunday as he walked home from Mass, holding hands with his girls on the street as they passed. All were agreed he was such a nice man. How could he have died with the gun in his hand? Fools and dreamers, dreamers and fools, mad men and schemers opposing all rules. And I can't tell but one. What history will show Villains are heroes Nobody knows Villains are heroes Nobody knows to sing a song of emigration uh, really with the theme of a of, of, of strong woman who takes matters into her own hands. Um, after the famine, uh, the whole way in which land was passed on changed completely in Irish society and uh, nothing was ever the same again after the famine. But particularly the way that land was passed on, now only one son uh, illegally got the farm. And uh, at that point, when the parents decided to hand it over, a woman from a similar economic station came with a dowry. Uh, and uh, it was very, very difficult, almost impossible to marry outside your class. Uh, friends of mine, uh, particularly the cultural geographer, uh, Jack Burchell, uh, did a study of families over about a 120 year period in County Kilkenny and, and uh, at Waterford and found that not one single family changed the position in the social order. It was that fixed on the land. Uh, so if you didn't have a dowry as a woman, there was no place for you in the system. You had to leave. And that's why more women than men emigrated from Ireland to America, making us unique among European uh, immigrant groups in the latter decades of the 19th century. And there were amazing women. They usually traveled on their own. Uh, a lot of them worked in, in, uh, in the textile mills and a lot of them worked as domestics and they saved money. And what the wonderful uh, historian, Philadelphia's own Dennis Clark, uh, the late Dennis Clark said that it constituted the greatest transatlantic philanthropy of the late 19th century. All these emigrants remittances sent back by these extraordinary women who postponed marriage and, uh, and just helped their, their brothers and sisters come out to America and helped improve the family circumstances. So we always like to sing a song in praise of these women. This is a particular song uh, which comes from Ennis Gillen. And this particular woman, her true love, uh, had headed off to North America in disgust because uh, the father disapproved of him and he was too poor. So she stole money from the Alphala, as we say at home. And uh, off she went, cheapest crossing from always from Belfast to Quebec, turned around cargo ships. Only one minor problem when she arrived in North America, where was he? So she went into a bar in Quebec to think matters over, and there he was having a drink at the bar. Ro Robbie says this is the Disney version of Irish immigration, and you know, he's probably right, but we don't care because it's a happy ending. 
You lovers all, both great and small, that dwell in thy land. And I hope you'll pay attention while I my pet command. It was my father's anger that drove my love away. But I'm still in hopes we will meet again in North America. My love is neat and handsome. To him I gave my heart. And little was our notion that ever we would part. It was in my father's garden this flower it did decay but I'm still in hopes it will bloom again in North America I did not want for money but fortune on me shines and from my father's castle I stole five hundred pounds it was in town of Belfast my passage I did pay my mind made up to follow my love to North America was kind to me as you might understand and she took me in her cabin until we reached the land it was in the town of Quebec we landed on the quay I knew not where to find my love in North America but I been sick and tired and sore, I went into an inn. And twas there I spied my William, the lad I loved with him. I gently took him by the hand, and to him I did say, I never thought I'd see your face in all of Mary. as you might understand and I hear that they live quite happily in a town that they call St. John and the money that she took from home in gold she paid it down and she thinks no more on higher land or in the skillet Billy and, and Jerry are going to play a tune together. You don't often hear uh, the, the accordion and the pipes do a duet, and we thought we'd regale you with the accordion and the pipes doing a duet. Why the hell not? There's a hum. Uh, I think it's the feedback coming from something here. Thank you. 
Uh, so Robbie was talking about Frank Hart earlier, the great song collector, um, and and I'm going to do a, a song that he um, that he did that I learned from a recording of his, um, and it's a, a song about Napoleon, and he put together a whole album of Napoleonic songs, and this is one of them. It's from the point of view of a woman who's lost her love um, in the war, and it's called Broken Hearted, I Will Wander, or The Bonnie White Horseman. Mm -mm. When Bonaparte commanded his troops for to stand, and he leveled his cannon all over the
Well, now um, we have another treat in store. Um, um, Matt and Emily, and, and they're, they're local. They, they come from somewhere else, but they're here now. They're <laughs> studying dance in Temple, and they're taking a PhD in, in dance in Temple. There's no what you might call ethnochoreology department in Temple, and there's no ethnochoreology department in Villanova, neither. Uh, but they're, they're managing to get their, their brand of dance uh, involved there, and they're very innovative people. Um, they start with a tradition, like most dancers and most musicians today, and you know, no, no tradition ever, ever uh, survives without a degree of innovation. And Seamus Egan, our, our great um, multi-instrumentalist in Philadelphia, said that one of the reasons that Irish music and dance is so popular around the world is that it remains imaginatively relevant in every generation. It has to do that, otherwise you'll end up in a museum. There's nothing sadder than that happening. No fear of that happening with great dancers like Matt and Emily. They're going to do kind of a, a piece. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. They, they talked about it, but um, you know you have to see it. And uh, talking about dancing is, is uh, you, you know, is, is very difficult. You, you have to see it. So they're going to start off with something that's uh, close to Shandos. That's the old style of Irish dancing that the immigrants carried with them before the the arms were down by the side. Yeah, but there was very much the arms were very loose uh, in the old style of dancing in the west of Ireland particularly. So you can see that is maybe part of the antecedents of clogging. But anyway, they're going to do that and they're going to do something else, and you'll see. <laughs> and uh, Jerry's going to play against them.
We're going to do an old love song this time called The Flower of Kilkenny. It's got a very easy chorus. I know you're all dying to sing. Because <laughs> uh, she's the beautiful flower of Kilkenny. Shall I gaze on her fair face no more? I've roamed through the world and seen many, but none like my Eileen Astor. Astor is just a little bit of Gaelic. It just literally means my treasure. So I'm expecting great things now, don't let me down, okay? <laughs> I once loved the flower of Kilkenny And the beautiful creature was she I loved her far better than Annie And I know that Johnny Darling loved me She's the beautiful flower of Kilkenny Shall I gaze on her fair face no more I roam through the world and see but there's none like my Eileen Stone. I remember the first time I met her And I thought that her heart I'd pursue And no man could have felt any better When she swore she would always be true She's the beautiful flower of Shall I gaze on her fair face no more? I roam through the world and see many, but there's none like my Eileen Astor. When she left me, she gave me a token, and that was an outburst of tears, and the words that were generally spoken. They remained in my memory for years. She's the beautiful flower of Kilkenny. Shall I gaze on her fair face no more? I roam through the world and see many. But there's none like my Eileen Astor. For this was the last of the tokens gave with a fond loving will and the words that were generally spoken they remain in my memory still your last chance she's the beautiful flower of Kilkenny shall I gaze on her fair face no more I roam through the world and see many but there's none like my Ivy she is the beautiful flower of Kilkenny. Shall I gaze on her fair face no more? I've roamed through the world and seen many, but there's none like my Eileen Astor. to do a novelty dance now and it's become uh, sort of part of the repertoire of a lot of Irish dance troops and it's called the broom dance or the brush dance and it had its origins uh, in the west of Ireland uh, when there were very few instruments around and the islands like say the Plasket Islands or the Aran Islands or Inish Boffin usually an old melodeon a, a very simplified version of what Billy's playing the two row button accordion there and the melodeon has only one row 
and playing a very limited number of keys, yet incredible music was played on it. So at a certain time in the evening, the melodeon would start, there'd be a house party, and somebody would get up uh, and, and want to dance, but he might be a bit, a, bit, a bit the worst for wear in the drink department. So the women wouldn't want to dance with him. So he'd take up a brush or a broom and dance around with it uh, until it was time for couples to dance. At least that's one of the theories of origin of the broom dance. And we like it because nobody can prove it isn't true. We love those kind of stories. Uh, and Niall, we, we spread this dance all over the world. We actually did it in Vietnam. And, and, and Niall dressed up in a rice farmer's costume. Uh, with a, a very old brush that he found. He got so fond of the brush, he thought he'd bring it back to America, so he'd have his own Vietnamese brush. But he came through Houston, and he was stopped by Homeland Security, and they wanted to fine him $10,000 for bringing in illegal seeds. These people have no sense of humor at all. <laughs> so it, the, the brush was confiscated, and we know not what happened to it. So this is a Villanova brush we have tonight. It's not nearly the caliber of the Hanoi brush, but sure will do. And Niall is going to dance the brush dance. And uh, Billy's going to start off in the key of C, where the old melodians would. And they will migrate with great optimism into the key of G, I think. <laughs> where Niall uh, has to give a good performance every night because otherwise he might do himself a mischief. Uh, anyway, I'm going to sing one more song and then we'll finish off with a set of tunes. And This is one of my favorite songs and it's very much an Irish-American song. Joseph Lennon and myself were having a chat outside before it. I've been in America 45 years now and I still am astonished to find out when I go back to Ireland how little people in Ireland know about Irish-America and how little they care. Um, and, and really, they haven't, they haven't a bull's notion what happens to Paddy and Sheila when they leave Ireland. And, and uh, even members of my own family don't even ask me much about what I'm doing over here. They just want to know, you know, how much I'm bringing home. And, and, uh, and that's the way it's always been. And hopefully, through Irish studies departments like the one here in Villanova, uh, we can educate uh, my country people at home uh, about what's been happening over the last few hundred years to these uh, 45, 50 million people of, of, of Irish descent here in this country and get them maybe a little bit interested. You know, the, the island of Ireland has maybe six and a half million people. If you look at the diaspora worldwide, 60 million. And uh, all of us can claim 
uh, some part of being Irish, of course. And one of the things that I was astonished with uh, when I came over here was to find out that we documented everything we did just as much over here as we did back in Ireland. Under colonialism, we had very limited ways of expressing our concerns, our point of view, maintaining our history. And over here uh, uh, and, and there, we did it through song and music and through storytelling and later on through literature. Uh, but over here, I found out the very same thing. If we did it, we wrote songs about it in the... If we building canals, building the railroads, the anthracite uh, mines of of, uh, of uh, eastern uh, Pennsylvania, um, the copper mines of Butte, Montana, the gold rush in Alaska and California. If we did it, there are songs about it. And the greatest Irish American songwriter of them all, and nobody knows anything about him in Ireland, is Ned Harrigan, uh, born in New York. And his people came to Newfoundland from County Cork as cod fishermen, uh, his grandfather did, but he himself was born in New York City. His father left Newfoundland and became a, sh a ship's a mate, and, uh, and he eventually left the sea and married a woman in Norfolk, Virginia. They moved to New York, and he was born the year before the Irish famine, turned into the greatest um, songwriter that Irish America has ever known. Uh, and he wrote over 320 songs about tenement life in New York with his cohort, David Braham. And David Braham's real name was David Abraham, and the family dropped the A because of anti-Semitism in, in England. So it was the first Irish-Jewish combo uh, in, in, in American songwriting and a very successful one. Harrigan and Hart and Braham, Har Hart, Tony Hart was his, was his, uh, his uh, stage mate. They invented musical theater long before Gilbert and Sullivan, eight years before them precisely. They had music and dance and, and songs uh, right on stage with the action and that's musical theater by any definition in the Lower East Side of New York. Uh, and their songs were known everywhere. Uh, he was known as the Dickens of New York because of his wordsmithing powers. And uh, he was a great songwriter. He was also known as the Moliere and the Euripides. He really liked that of New York. But anyway, sing my favorite song of his, and I made a whole uh, CD of these songs, is McNally's Row Flats. Down in Bottle Alley lived Timothy McNally, a decent politician and a gentleman at that. Be loved by all the neighbors, the gossoons and the babies that occupied the building called McNally's Row of Flats. And it's Ireland and Italy, Jerusalem and Germany, Chinese and Africans and a paradise for rats, all jumbled up together in the snow and rainy weather. They constitute the tenants in McNally's row of flats. That great conglomeration of men from every nation, the Tower of Babylonia, it couldn't equal that. A peculiar institution where the brogues without dilution rattled up together in McNally's row of flats. And this Ireland and Italy, Jerusalem, Germany, Chinese and Africans and a paradise for rats all jumbled up together in the snow and rainy weather. They constitute the tenants in McNally's row of flats. Italian lazzaronis and lots of hungry cats Lying on the benches and dying there by inches From the open ventilation in McNally's row of flats And it's Ireland and Italy, Jerusalem and Germany Chinese and Africans and the paradise for rats All jumbled up together in the snow and Row of flats. It never was expected that the rent would be collected. They levied on the furniture, the bedding, and the slats. And it's then you'd see the rally as they battled down the alley. If 
evicted from the building called McNally's Row of Flats. And it's Ireland that makes the dangers of London and Germany, Chinese and Africans and the paradise for rats. All the jumbo rats together in the snow and rainy weather. They constitute the tenants in McNally's Row of Flats. mightiest songwriter of Irish American, Ned Harrigan, and the mightiest tune maker, that's without the words of, of, uh, of, of instrumental music in the history of, of Irish music since Turlico Carlin, was Ed Reavy from Philadelphia. And Ed was an immigrant from County Cavan, came over at the age of 16 in the year 1912. Uh, he turned to the plumbing trade, was a master plumber, uh, and he was a very good fiddle player, but he's real, he recorded for Victor in 1927, just one, one side. But his real talent was, was in composing. Somebody had to compose all this music that we play, that's folk music. Somebody had to do it. And, and my first project when I came to study folklore at the University of Pennsylvania was to study Ed Reavy's composition. And I became great friends with him. He took me in. I didn't uh, know too many people here. And he minded me, as we say at home. I was welcome in his house any time. And he wouldn't hear me taking public West transport in West Philly. He would always come uh, in one of those cars with the big long fins. I, I don't know what make it was. Uh, it was uh, from the 19th century <laughs> maybe. But anyway, he, he used to always drive me out to his house and I used to ask him lots of silly questions about how he composed tunes. He was very patient with me. But basically, never, he never learned to read or write music. Uh, he just had a gift. And he would go down to the basement of his house. He lived in Palton Village. It was called Corktown at the time. And, uh, and he would just go down when the kids were asleep and he would take out the fiddle and run his bow over the strings and if, he, if something pleasing came to him, he would build a tune on that. And then uh, if, he, if he had the tune, he would play it for his good friend Charlie Doherty, who was a, a Donegal immigrant. If Charlie liked it, he kept it. If he didn't, that was the end of it. He never played it again. So God knows how many tunes he composed, but we have a lot of them. And they're passed into the living tradition. I guarantee you can go to a session in Sydney, Australia, you can go to, uh, to Sheridan's Bar in Ho Chi Minh City, Finnegan's Bar in Hanoi, and you're going to hear Ned Reavy tune before the night's out. His music has gone over the wall and is part of our culture. When we come to the end of a concert, we always try, if we're in the area here, to pay tribute to him and indeed to all the great musicians that we've learned from who never got the chance to play concerts like this. Uh, they're just, it wasn't fashionable at that time. Uh, and people like John Beasy in Philadelphia from Sligo, Eddie Cahill from Sligo, uh, all the great musicians uh, who played here when it was not fashionable. So we paid them tribute. Also, I'd like to thank Joseph Lennon and his assistant, Wendy, for uh, inviting us here uh, to play in Villanova. And thank you all for coming along this evening and, uh, and for being uh, and listening to our music. And you've been, you've been wonderful, and you give us great honor. Thank you very, very much, and we hope we see you down the road. We're doing a concert, in, in a benefit concert, uh, many of us here on the stage, for uh, St. Malachy's. In fact, all of us here on the stage. Uh, and, and many mothers besides. For St. Malachy's, uh, the, the, the school in North Philadelphia, we've been doing it for 30 years, for Father John McNamee, the mighty man, uh, the great social activist. We're doing it on the first Sunday in November at two o'clock. So warn the neighbors, we're coming again. Uh, and uh, it's free to get in, but it's not free to get out. Um, so uh, so uh, we hope to see some of you there, or at least some of your friends. Thank you again, and uh, we're going to finish with the tribute to Ed Reavy. All these tunes are composed by Ed. Now, have we got a running order of these? Because uh, we're going to play the three, and then who's, who's going next then? Is Haley you going? Or, or are you? Spade on the jig. Are you going to play? No, you're not, okay. <laughs> It's, it's good to know these things, you know. Well, uh, so, Haley, you're going to play a solo, one of Ed Reavy's um, tunes in memory of Coleman, right? And how about you, Jerry? Are you going to play one of his? Uh, so it'll be, it'll be the three tunes, and then you, and then Jerry will play, and then we'll play the, the one. And then we finish with the Hunter's House. That's the plan. 
Very optimistic.